So, um, you know, the, the bosonic atoms that we've been cooling in our laboratories um, have, a lot, have internal degrees of freedom. They have a lot of uh, internal states. Um, the electrons could be excited, or they can, uh, maybe the spins could be excited. And so, um, uh, potentially, you have uh, a rather rich quantum gas at your disposal, one which uh, has not just uh, the regular features we might expect of quantum gases, um, poly blocking, superfluidity, and everything that follows, um, but also a lot of uh, richness of the internal structure and questions about how these two things uh, talk to one another. Uh, out of uh, very many possibilities for what kind of uh, multi-component gases you can imagine working with, I'm going to focus on uh, working with alkali atoms and working with gases where their uh, hyperfine spin, uh, spin is the object which is, uh, which is free to evolve, gives a, the fluid its, its richness. So um, uh, at the risk of being too simplistic, I'm going to remind you a little bit about uh, alkali atoms. And I'll start with uh, the example of uh, uh, one of the isotopes of rubidium, which is uh, rubidium-87. So um, if you uh, buy some rubidium-87, it, uh, it comes in an ampoule, it's a metal. And if you get a really great microscope, you'll see a single atom that looks like this. Um, it has a nucleus, which has um, uh, 37 uh, new, uh, protons. No, was it? Sorry, it's 37 protons and 50 neutrons. And you don't want to know anything about the uh, composition of this nucleus, except to know that it has an overall spin, in this case of uh, three atoms, given that there's an odd number of uh, nucleons inside the nucleus. And then it's surrounded by 37 uh, electrons, and uh, a whole bunch of them, 36 of them, are doing uh, nothing whatsoever. They're just a neutral core with uh, not much by way of dynamics, certainly no spare spin. And then there's one electron left over, which occupies the valence cell, uh, shell. So you can talk about the electronic structure of rubidium, mostly focusing just on uh, the different states of this electron and the extent to which it interacts with the leftover spin of the core, which is the core of the nucleus, which is the spin of the nucleus. Um, okay, so because this electron doesn't live in a hydrogenic uh, potential, it lives in a potential which is uh, the nucleus, but which is screened by all of these electrons you find that the uh, different states with the same principal quantum number separate out in energy. So the lowest energy state is the 5s, and the next one up is the 5p. And these guys are separated by a pretty large uh, energy, uh, 1.6 electron volts. So that's enough that you can almost see the light that uh, rubidium emits on this uh, transition. Things get a little more complicated when we consider the fact that if the electron has orbital angular momentum, there's a spin orbit interaction. So to the next order, we realize that um, this uh, transition is actually comprised of two different transitions, having to do with the different total angular momentum of the uh, electron. And this uh, uh, fine structure splitting is uh, fairly significant, so that the wavelength that's, uh, of, of light that's emitted on one of these transitions is quite different from that which is emitted on the other one. So you can resolve these uh, different transitions quite easily. OK, so that's the spin orbit. Next order down, we consider the hyperfine interactions. The hyperfine interactions, as you recall, are a factor of 1,000 times smaller than the splittings that we've indicated so far, because the nuclear magnetic moment is a thousandth of the electron magnetic moment. So that leads to, leads to a little bit of uh, extra splitting of these lines. Now, in if I take this atom and I put it in a uh, uh, in a completely rotationally symmetric environment, um, then uh, its, uh, its eigenstates, its energy eigenstates are going to be eigenstates also of the total angular momentum. And that total angular momentum, which I'll denote by the letter uh, F, is going to be from the sum of the uh, magnetic mo or the angular momentum that the electron carries, J, and the angular momentum that the nucleus carries. So that, that's what I'll call the hyperfine spin. <coughs> This lowest level splits into uh, two states, where the values uh, of the total spin are uh, i plus a half and uh, i minus a half. And these guys are split by uh, a much smaller <coughs> energy, much smaller than this splitting over here. So the energy to drive a transition between these guys is in the gigahertz range. 
6.8 gigahertz. And then, of course, the excited states also get split up, which is interesting for the optics of this object, but not terribly important for the rest of what I wanted to tell you. Okay, so there's uh, this structure of an alkali atom. This one happens to be rubidium. And if you wanted to consider the other alkali atoms, you would just swap out the value of I, and there would be changes maybe in some of the orders of the energy levels. But nothing uh, untoward would happen. Uh, rubidium-87 is uh, a boson. It's a boson because, of course, the number of electrons and the number of protons is the same. So sum them up, that's an even number. So whether a neutral atom is a boson or a fermion has to do with how many neutrons it carries. And nuclei are happier carrying even numbers of, nuclei, of neutrons than odd numbers. So most atoms in the periodic table are bosons. A few of them are fermions. It's a general feature. OK. Now, let's focus a little bit more on uh, the splitting between these two energy levels. And uh, what, might happen, what might happen to these levels uh, in an experimental setting when we add also a uh, magnetic field? Okay, so now we get to the uh, uh, hyperfine Hamiltonian, which is going to have uh, some uh, term due to the coupling between the nucleus, uh, the spin-spin coupling between the nucleus and the electron. And there'll be some uh, prefactors here, but basically these are just numbers that you uh, either calculate with difficulty with the help of a nuclear theorist or you just measure. Um, and then there's the coupling of the uh, magnetic moment of the atom with the magnetic field that may be applied. And as you recall from your atomic physics courses, the problem with uh, solving problems of this sort is that um, uh, the magnetic moment comes from all the different sources of angular momentum in an atom, and the different parts of the angular momentum contribute uh, different amounts, with different proportionalities. <coughs> Anyhow, so we can, uh, we can figure out what this magnetic moment is. If we're just interested in what the physics is when we apply a magnetic field that doesn't uh, mix up the different, value, different levels of J, so it's not strong enough to do that, then you can make an approximation that this thing is uh, proportional to the electron angular momentum. You can neglect the nuclear part because it's so small. And then you can go ahead and solve this Hamiltonian. So we can solve for the energy levels um, predicted by this Hamiltonian with a little bit of algebra, um, but there's uh, no point doing so. It's simple enough. And so we'll just uh, look at what the uh, result is. So what you find for the structure of this, uh, the energy levels of this atom in an applied magnetic field is the following. This is something you would call the bright the bright Robbie diagram, because I guess these were the guys who uh, solved the, the equation to the right, to the right first. And uh, what you find is the following. As you remember, at low magnetic fields, uh, the, the magnetic field is uh, insufficiently strong to mix the different uh, total spin states. And so its effect is just to give uh, a linear, essentially a linear Zeeman shift. And the energy levels split. There's a linear slope here. And uh, the energy levels are characterized by the value of the total hyperfine spin and by the projection of that total hyperfine spin upon, let's say, the field axis. Okay. And here the uh, splitting uh, at low order is linear. And then there's also a linear Zeeman splitting in the upper level. If you look over a broader range of magnetic field, which you real at some point, of course, the magnetic field is strong enough that it couples the different states, the, the states with different values of f. So the total spin f is no longer a good quantum number. You have to actually explicitly write out what the states are. And you see that the energy levels kind of shift in a um, somewhat less straightforward way. And there's a vestige of this uh, deviation from linear uh, Zeeman shifts already apparent at very low magnetic field, where you find that, for example, the average energy of this guy and this guy is not the same as the uh, energy of that guy by a small amount. So that would be something that is uh, experimentally important. It's something which changes the physics of these gases uh, and also is something that the experimentalist has a handle on in, in uh, dictating the physics. So later on, I'll talk about a quadratic Zeeman shift. And what I mean is the deviation of these lines from linear. OK, now you want to do experiments with these uh, gases. So you have 
Here's just for video 87, I've got eight levels in the electronic ground state to work with. Boy, I could write a lot of books, you know, there's a lot of mixtures of these things, and we can study a lot of their different combinations. And in fact, there's a lot of things that uh, constrain us. Um, one of the things we have to think about when we're uh, working with these gases is how we're going to hold them. These gases are at temperatures that are much colder than anything else we have in the universe, so we can't just pour them in a bucket and carry them around, we have to suspend them in a vacuum flask. And we suspend them using fields. And the fields can either be magnetic or electric. Um, what the magnetic field, if you imagine putting your gas of atoms now in a, a magnetic field configuration where the magnetic field is inhomogeneous, you see that there's a potential energy for the atom moving around in that magnetic field. Because, for example, if this axis is uh, you know, uh, the x axis when you have a magnetic field that varies linearly in strength, uh, which has a gradient, a uh, spatial gradient, then uh, you know, the potential energy of an m equals minus one, f equals one atom would, let's say, increase as we move to one direction. Or that of a different atom might decrease as we move to a different direction. So you can imagine there's a way of setting up the magnetic fields in space so that the atom always gets a force to push it back toward the center, and then we can suspend our atoms uh, in a vacuum flask. So doing that kind of experiment is uh, limiting because the atoms that have different spin states now move in different directions. They feel very different forces. Uh, some of them might be trapped. Some of them might be deliberately anti-trapped and shoved onto the walls of the vacuum chamber. So experiments uh, working with uh, atoms in combinations of spin states for all the different functions that we have for those combinations of spin states typically do not occur in magnetic traps because of what I've told you about, but occur inside of optical traps. And the way uh, optical traps work um, is the following. There's, of course, uh, an electric dipole interaction. So there would be a potential energy, oops, excuse me, which is the uh, dot product of the uh, dipole operator and the electric field. Now, of course, um, for an atom uh, in its uh, ground state, uh, there is no net dipole moment, because it's in a parity eigenstate. Um, but if you apply uh, an electric field, the electric field can induce a uh, dipole moment on the atom, and that induced dipole moment can interact with the electric field. So you can uh, get a situation where there's uh, a dipole moment, which is a product of the polarizability and the electric field, and this would be dotted uh, with the electric field. I'm letting this polarizability here be a scalar, but in fact it's actually a tensor, which makes it a little more complicated. And so now, of course, if I have, let's say, uh, a laser beam, so I have a, a beam of light uh, focused somewhere, uh, the average electric field is zero, but the average of the square of the electric field is certainly non-zero, that's the intensity of the light. And so you see now I have a potential energy that's proportional to the intensity of the light. <coughs> And the proportionality is given by this uh, quantity over here, which is what's known as the dynamic polarizability. And uh, an, a nuclear, an, an atom like uh, this alkali atom rubidium is not terribly polarizable um, because there's this really huge energy difference between the ground state and excited state. These are the nearest uh, states of opposite parity. But if you drive this atom with an electric field that's near it's the resonance frequency, then you can, of course, enhance the effect resonantly and get uh, a very large uh, polarizability. And so what you'll find is that the polarizability as a function of frequency of the laser light goes like this. Where there's a, an optical transition, um, the polarizability will have some sort of uh, distinct behavior, and uh, it'll basically look like this. So uh, right near the resonance, let's say a little bit to the red or to the blue of the transition, you can get very strong polarizability. <coughs> As you move away, the polarizability drops off like one over the detuning, essentially. The detuning being the energy difference between uh, the energy of your photon and the energy of the uh, actual transition, the resonance. Um, there's some subtleties with how strong the optical trap is if the frequency of the laser light is really small compared to the resonance frequency, but there's no point in going through uh, those details. But the point of this graph is simply to show a couple of things. One is that I can now trap all of the uh, atoms that are shown in that diagram with the same optical trap. 
I might find situations where uh, the light has a different polarizability for different inter internal states of the uh, ground state atom. But I can arrange situations where that state dependence is minimal. And so now I can create an optical trap that holds all of these atoms regardless of their spin orientation. Now it starts becoming uh, an interesting problem. Yes? Sorry, just to make sure, that omega naught is the same as your 1.16 naught, is that right? Uh, yes, or maybe it's the energy difference corresponding to those two separate transitions. So I'm just thinking if I have one resonance, mm -hmm. then that would be my omega naught. If I actually have that di the real diagram where I have um, excuse me, several potential uh, transitions here and to here and to other levels as well, then you know there'll be all sorts of other resonances that show up. I see. The point it has to be some resonance between S and P. You'll you'll look for H or yeah if you want, yes, exactly. Between uh, opposite parity states that are connected by an electric dipole transition. Okay, so optical traps finally enable us to hold all of these atoms in the same container. And now that spin degree of freedom is actually something that we can work with and we can look for the physical effects of it. And uh, in particular, the combinations that people have studied are the combination of all these levels, for example, where all the atoms have the same total spin, let's say one, but the orientation of that spin is something which is allowed to vary dynamically. It's not dictated by the trapping method, it's just doing whatever physics tells it to do. Or people can trap all the atoms in that upper level, the F equals two level, and do you know, whatever physics these, uh, these levels do as well. Excuse me. Uh, probably a very stupid question, but I don't understand why the polarizability goes to zero exactly at resonance. I would expect to have the largest polarizability there. Yes, this is the real part of the polar polarizability. So maybe that will answer it. So uh, just think of driving a harmonic oscillator and right on resonance its response is exactly 90 degrees out of phase with the drive. So in that case you'll have no real polarizability. There actually won't be a, a dipole potential on the atom. The atom will just be scattering like that. But in fact, we never, we never end up wanting to sit there because of all that light scattering. So typically, optical traps will be at something like that far down, you know, a good fraction of the energy of the photon down. Now, one thing I wanted to emphasize about these optical traps is that they're uh, pretty flexible tools because I can just, you know, get a little bit of laser light. And in fact, the laser light that I need for trapping an atom is um, not much different than what's coming out of this laser pointer on occasion. Um, just a few milliwatts of light. And, um, and using uh, just a few or maybe many milliwatts of light, we can form traps also that have variable dimensionality. So the dimension of our gas, in whatever sense we want to characterize the dimension, is something that is now flexible. So for example, I've done a number of experiments where we take uh, a light beam and maybe in a plane uh, right before the light beam hits a lens, uh, the beam is very extended along one dire direction. And uh, after we put this thing through a lens, it, uh, it gets focused and it gets more focused, it gets focused more tightly along uh, uh, one of these transverse directions than along the other one. It also is very loosely focused along the direction of the focus. That's always going to be, often going to be the weakest uh, direction in which the light is converging. So if I trap atoms in a laser beam, let's say that atoms are trapped in a reddituned laser beam, in the region where the intensity is maximum, in a beam that is focused like this, then the atomic gas would have the shape sort of of a surfboard. It would be skinny in one direction, but thick in the other two. I can, so I can look at two-dimensional gases that way. Um, or I can uh, take the light that's uh, striking this lens and I can, uh, I can make it uh, circular, I can make it round. So now I'm going to end up maybe with a trap that is uh, tightly confining in these two dimensions but very long in the third dimension so I can produce a one dimensional gas for you. Uh, or I can be more flexible than that, I can use uh, interfering laser beams and create optical lattices where the atoms are trapped, let's say, at the maximum or the minimum of the intensity of light that are formed at the interference of several plane waves. And so, uh, if let's say I take uh, two laser beams and they're counter-propagating like this, then the trap that's produced here is a stack of uh, two-dimensional layers. 
very tightly confined along this direction. In this direction, the confinement is to less than a wavelength of light. But in the other two directions, the confinement can be very soft. So I can look at a lot of two-dimensional systems, or just one, if I'm interested. Um, if I add another set of laser beams in this direction, um, then the atoms will be trapped in long tubes that come out of the board. So it would have a whole set of one-dimensional gases to play with. And then finally, if I supplement this with a third set of laser, beam, uh, laser beams, I would trap the atoms tightly in all directions, and I could have you know, sort of a zero-dimensional gas, one that where basically there's no, there's no spatial degrees of freedom left to the gas. And all we're going to be talking about is the physics of the internal degrees of freedom. Okay, so these are traps of, uh, which are non-specific to the spin, but allow you to vary the dimensionality of the system quite a bit In terms of the criteria for dimensionality, you, you start realizing that you have to think about what you mean by a, an object having a reduced dimensionality. And uh, in making that determination, you have to say, um, what, what are you trying to freeze out um, by constraining the gas type P? Okay, so, um, you know, I can, let's say, take uh, one of the directions in which I'm confining the atoms and characterize that confinement by some uh, trapping frequency, by the curvature at the bottom of that trapping potential. So that then introduces uh, an energy, so the confinement energy. And I can uh, consider what might happen if this thing, if this confinement energy is much larger than uh, uh, kT, then I would say that my uh, thermally, uh, there's no excitations left in that particular dimension. So that would be um, uh, where, sort of in a thermodynamic sense, I can consider the gas as being of reduced dimensionality. And if I want, a, if I'm thinking about a gas of bosons, I can think about either superfluids that form in three dimensions or ones that form in two dimensions through the costless thallus transition, or I can think about uh, one dimensional chains and, or one dimensional gases and um, the sort of crossover behaviors that you see in one dimension and so forth. Um, when you're uh, confined, so this is sometimes the level to which we uh, confine atoms. Um, there's other energy scales that uh, come in as well. So for example, when I have a, a gas of bosons that have become quantum degenerate, and uh, they all fall into the same uh, ground state wave function in the container, um, I'll find that uh, there's, uh, I can get effective repulsions between the atoms in the container. So the, uh, there can be a, a, a finite compressibility of the gas. And uh, that will lead to the gas having uh, chemical potential. So uh, the chemical, sorry to use the same uh, letter. So the chemical potential of the gas, which will be, uh, in this case, related to the S wave scattering length and the density of the gas, that introduces another energy scale to the problem, which may be different than the thermal energy scale. And I can think about uh, what happens when I uh, freeze out, uh, when I get to a condition where um, I freeze out uh, uh, this chemical potential as well, yes? Sorry, the expression you showed for chemical potential is for a 3D gas, right? Yeah. Does it become, I mean, you have to look at different criteria when combining one, one dimensionally or two dimensionally? Um, only in the sense that I have to think about what densities I'm using. Um, so if, if the atoms are, uh, are correlated so as to avoid each other, um, it would be silly of me to use sort of a mean field expression that quantifies their interaction energy. So yes, this was a, I mean, at, at, at base we're always thinking about um, we're often thinking about um, atoms interacting by S-wave collisions and um, often treating the <coughs> actual molecular potential by a pseudo-potential. But where we go from there, I think we have to know details of the state in order to exactly determine the chemical potential. But in any case, I want to point out that there's um, sometimes t there are times when you do or you don't end up uh, freezing out this uh, interaction energy. Well, which is basically to say um, 
does my gas have any um, accessible phonons? Are there any sort of charge dynamics in the, in the dimension of interest here? So we'll, we maybe we'll find situations where we don't freeze things out in terms of uh, temperature, uh, but maybe we, we freeze out sort of the phonon dynamics in the system. And there will also be uh, another energy scale that will crop up in a couple of slides, which is the, uh, the uh, spin-dependent interaction energy. Uh, symbol to give it. So the spin-dependent spin interaction energy, which following this line of uh, um, loose reasoning might uh, be the same, but maybe there's a difference in scattering lengths that gives the spin-dependent interaction. And uh, I will uh, often find situations where, um, in terms of the phonon dynamics, uh, or in terms of you know, whether we want to characterize the system as being truly superfluid or being, uh, or having a condensate or having a superfluid or being one dimensional, maybe uh, we have different criteria in mind for uh, the charge dynamics of the system and for the spin dynamics of the system. And I don't think the implications of these sort of different dimensional criteria for the different degrees of freedom has been worked out fully in all of the um, uh, theoretical studies of spinner bose gases, certainly not experimentally yet. But it's something that we're always keeping in mind uh, in the experiments. And you'll see that influence of the dynamics quite a bit. Okay, now back to this uh, diagram. Um, things are not entirely as rosy as how I've painted them out because um, there's also the question of the stability of these gases. So uh, as I'll get to in a few slides, if you're working at a typical magnetic field, um, say the magnetic field produced by the uh, elevator in our physics building of a few milligauss, then there's, there's a particular energy difference between these different levels, the different spin projections. Okay? So, you know, at... Uh, at uh, tens of milligauss in terms of uh, thermal units, that's already going to be a microkelvin of energy. Okay. So if I'm trapping atoms, let's say, in uh, some of these levels, and they had a way of colliding with each other in a way that they could lower the total projection of their spin along the field axis, like, you know, one of two of these guys could collide and one of them could fall down to a lower energy level, that would be a disaster. That'd be like a microkelvin of energy per collision. And the temperatures at which I'm going to be conducting these experiments is typically, I don't know, uh, 10 or 100 nanokelvin or lower. So a microkelvin or you know, even more in our magnetic fields would, would just be completely dead. So we have to um, pay a lot of attention to the degree to which our trapped gases are uh, stable. Or I suppose metastable, which is to say, if, if, uh, if the gas could really equilibrate completely, um, uh, it would be pretty obvious that in an applied magnetic field of any reasonable strength, all of my bosons would accumulate in this lo very lowest energy level, and the physics would be cease becoming interesting. And you might then worry that I have to go really to zero magnetic fields to make sure that we can't uh, uh, that we can that we can explore the other other energy levels. Uh, but there's uh, quite a few atoms. Um, the one that I've been exhibiting so far in the is happens to be one where uh, these kinds of uh, dipolar relaxation mechanisms uh, don't occur. Well, they occur, but very rarely. So uh, it'll turn out that the projection of the total spin along the z-axis is, is conserved for the duration of the experiment. And that's, uh, that's important to be able to study mixtures of atoms in different spin states. You might also worry about whether you can study atoms in those upper spin levels, right? So if a couple of these atoms in the F equals 2 levels have a way of colliding so that the orientation of the electron spins and the nuclear spins gets jiggled up a little bit, um, then maybe an atom emerges from the collision down in this lower energy level. And that's a lot of energy. That's the 6.8 gigahertz. So that's, that's huge. Um, so, uh, so we don't want that to occur uh, either. Um, but so in, in rare occasions, we'll find that there are uh, alkali gases which do remain fairly stable in those upper levels. But typically, that upper level is verboten. You don't want to stick your atoms up there. The atoms will decay rapidly. So what we know of so far in terms of these uh, um, spinner bose gases that people can work with uh, is the following uh, table. So um, here's a bunch of alkali atoms. And in all of them, 
the lowest hyperfine level of the two that I showed you is one that is uh, fairly stable, and indeed you can trap atoms optically, let them interact with each other, and look for interesting physics. Um, the experimental work has basically all been done with these two gases, and the other ones we're still waiting for experiments. Um, rubidium 87 is a bit of a magical atom that it happens to be that also in the upper hyperfine level, um, the atoms can live uh, and collide with each other in this optical trap without releasing a ton of energy, at least not right away. So while the lifetime of these upper hyperfine level atoms is limited, there's enough time for physics to go on. There is. Um, can you say what parameter? What's controlling that? What's controlling that? Yeah, not well. No, not exactly. So what's going on when you have? Um, so you have you have uh, two alkali atoms that are colliding, and each of the alkali atoms maybe is not in some sort of stretched state, which is to say that. Uh, there's components of the atomic uh, of, of the atomic state where the electron is spin up or spin down. There's particular superpositions of up and down with the nucleus doing the right thing. Uh, oh, in a they're in the hyperfines. They're in the F, F, FFZ state. Right. So, if, right? Yeah, yeah. so if I look at if I look at one of these uh, upper energy levels, say one of these upper energy levels, right? Uh, F equals M equals one, right? So I can get to M equals 1 with the nucleus being a 3 half state and the electrons pointing down and the nucleus being 1 half and the electron pointing up. And the F equals 2, M equals 1 state is a particular superposition of those two states. Right, so now the atoms uh, come and collide with one another. And as the particles get close to each other, they realize that at short range, uh, the ener the, there's a molecular potential. And the energy of these two atoms as they're coming together depends on the uh, total spin of the electrons. That's because, essentially, it's the electron uh, molecular states um, where the electrons are strongly interacting, which are the ones that are creating this borne up and higher molecular potential to begin with. So the atoms come together, and they realize that there's a, an electron singlet potential, and there's uh, an electron uh, triplet potential, and they have different energies as a function of position. Um, and there's terms that couple them. There's off-diagonal terms as well. So the Particles come in, and all of a sudden they're in a potential uh, surface. They're moving in some multi-parameter space, and when they uh, emerge at the output, it's not surprising that the um, that the spin states can get scrambled up. And so, at, at the outcome of this collision, each atom may not may no longer be in this particular combination of nuclear and electron spin to remain in the upper hyperfine level. Very often, it'll have ended up in one of the lower hyperfine. Levels. That's, so what, that's isn't that the case for the lower levels? Uh, right. So uh, in a um, right. So why is it not the case that um, that, for example, two atoms in, in this well, you know, so one thing that happens in these collisions is that the total uh, value of uh, the angular momentum along the spin direction will often turn out to be a fairly conserved quantity. And there you have to look at what are these off-diagonal terms in it that cause mixtures among the molecular potentials that will actually mix states uh, of different spin projection. And I believe those are simply weaker. Those are going to be uh, dipolar interactions and um, if the collision doesn't last a long time, that bipolar interaction a, or maybe hyperfine interactions at a fair distance between the objects doesn't have enough time to actually flip spins. That's softly the argument. Uh, but that being said, there are examples of alkali atoms where this dipolar relaxation does occur. So uh, the, the famous one is cesium. So um, the magnetic moment of a bare cesium atom is the same as the magnetic moment of a bare rubidium atom. It's you know, going to be one more magneton. But the difference is that when uh, two cesium atoms come together and collide, um, first of all, they're uh, near a collision resonance, so they spend a lot of time near each other. And then, um, secondly, the hyperfine interactions are stronger. I guess, basically, spin orbit interactions are stronger because of the heavier nucleus. And, um, and they will emerge in different spin states. So, cesium atoms, if you trap them in anything but uh, the very lowest, it's not F equals 2, but anyhow, the very lowest. Um, magnetic sublevel, the atoms will quickly rain down to that lowest sublevel. So that's going to be an unstable uh, gas against this kind of 
Uh, other examples are these, uh, um, so there's my unstable. Um, there's cesium. Uh, other atoms are, um, uh, so there's some atoms where, as I've been pointing out in response to that question, where the projection of the spin along the z-axis is conserved through collisions. There's other atoms where it's essentially not conserved uh, through collisions. So the example I gave you was cesium. But there are these other atoms that people are doing experiments with these days as well. And uh, in this case, the issue is that the magnetic moment of the atom the magnetic moment of the atom is really big, so as the atoms get close to each other, there's magnetic dipolar interaction that is significant. And these things also undergo dipolar relaxation quite rapidly. So if you want to do experiments on spinner bose gases with these atoms, you really do have to sit at zero magnetic field. And people are doing that now experimentally. Whereas lazy experimentalists can still work with these guys and get interesting physics out. Uh, one question. Um, so what do you do to get rid of the elevator? Um, the elevator? What do I do to get rid of the elevator? <laughs> well, if you want to get, if Sorry. you want to, if want to use these, um, and have to get zero magnetic field. How do you deal with it experimentally? Yes. Well, the easiest thing to do is to put a sign on the elevator <laughs> and ask people not to use it. That actually works pretty well in the physics building. We also benefit from the fact that I'm at a state university, and um, and things aren't maintained, so the elevator is often broken. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then at least, I think, yeah. The issue with elevators is that the, uh, the counterweight is magnetic. The counterweight is iron, because it's just an easy way to get a heavy mass. I mean, they could have made it out of something non-magnetic. It doesn't matter, it's just a weight. Oh well. Um, no, but what you end up doing is you uh, wrap uh, mu metal shielding, so stuff which is very uh, magnetically permeable around your experiment, which shunts the field lines around your experiment, that helps. And the other thing is you measure the field and compensate. So you just get good magnetic sensors nearby and you hook up power supplies and you try to cancel it out actively. But you'd rather just live with an elevator running up and down. And so we'll do like that. But that being said, you know, the field of ultra-cold atomic physics has moved forward very fast. And it's remarkable uh, when you see a big breakthrough in the field, sometimes it's something that no one would have thought of. You know, it really catapults the field forward. Other times, it's just somebody really not taking it for granted that something is really difficult. So I remember there was sort of an early stage where it seemed like the big breakthrough of the year was basically that somebody got a better lens. And they imaged with better spatial resolution. Now that they threw away the old lens, they bought one that was like $100 more expensive than ours. That was the cause for their nature. <laughs> Actually, physics gets a little harder to extract from that, but that's been the state so far. All right, so jokes aside, let me talk about um, uh, interactions. And of course, the physics, the dynamics, the ground state physics in these uh, Bose gases, what will make them interesting is the fact that these different spin states are not just um, you know, red, blue, green states. These are states of different projections of the same atomic spin. And so you would expect that uh, isotropy, rotational invariance, is going to lead to a lot of simplifications of uh, the physics of these gases. So just like how you uh, understand solid state systems by identifying symmetries and seeing the implications of those symmetries and finding states in which those symmetries are broken and the implications of that, we're going to do the same thing here. Here it's essentially the rotational symmetry, which is the most uh, important concept in simplifying the physics of these gases. So that will be the theme. And uh, we'll follow that theme uh, now to study uh, the implications of rotational symmetry on the interactions between these cold atoms. And I'll show you that with, um, with a few approximations, you can uh, reason that the interactions between these atoms have to have an extremely simple form that makes them uh, reasonable to study. Okay. So we have a collision between two alkali atoms. And uh, they're going to collide. They're going to start off in these uh, internal states. And uh, let's say we're going to treat the, the molecular potential between them as a central potential and neglect effects of the trap or something. So now we can just think that the input state is uh, a state which has a particular uh, orbital angular momentum and a particular velocity, uh, incoming radial velocity. There is a collision, and that collision couples this incoming state to that outgoing state. And so we want to know how complicated this matrix is. And um, you know, without simplifications, this could be really complicated, and therefore not terribly interesting to, uh, to understand it then. So let me try to take you through some of the approximations that we make in order to boil it down to something extremely simple. 
The first has to do with um, the fact that the atoms are very uh, slow approaching each other. We already have atoms that are cooled down to temperatures of a microkelvin or a nanokelvin, and so the incident velocity is uh, super small. Now, what's the uh, implication of that? So if you look at a typical molecular potential, the one that Leo was asking me to describe with my hand, um, at short range, uh, I, give, I would give an answer that is as befuddling as the one I gave you, because the short range physics of this molecular potential is indeed very complex. There's all sorts of different potential surfaces, um, and there's coupling between them. It's a very rich uh, and complicated problem. And the issue is, of course, that it's not just two atoms interacting with each other at a distance. It's all these constituents, all these electrons piling up on top of one another. So the, the inners of the potential are very uh, complicated. Um, and then there's some uh, distance beyond which the potential gets to be very simple, because now I just have atoms interacting with each other rather than all the electrons talking individually to one another. Okay, so we're going to make um, uh, several assumptions. We're going to say that the uh, long-range part of the uh, interaction between the atoms is something that for now I can put aside. Uh, and that's important to do because it turns out that a 1 over r cubed potential has some uh, special properties in terms of the partial wave analysis that you don't want to deal with right away. So we're going to put this thing aside. Just consider the short-range interaction between these uh, colliding atoms. And we're going to assume, moreover, that the atoms are uh, colliding at such low incident energies that their de Broglie wavelengths are uh, much larger than the, than the range of this, uh, the size of this molecular potential. And as you know from uh, your introductory quantum mechanics courses, that means that uh, we, are, we are justified in using a partial wave analysis to describe the collisions. We're always justified. But moreover, it's a good choice to make because only the lowest partial wave collisions can occur. And the other ones, the uh, particles with angular momentum simply can't get close to each other, uh, close enough to each other to see the insides of the potential. And so that, okay, so that simplification means that uh, we can describe collision simply by the uh, S-wave collision parameters. And as I've told you, uh, we're going to neglect this long-range uh, interaction. There can still be a lot of different S-wave uh, uh, scattering lengths. And we have to figure out how many of those there are in the problem as well. So we'll keep trying to visit uh, approximations. So the next approximation has to do with the fact that the interactions are rotationally symmetric. Now, I'm going to do my experiments in the presence of an elevator in Burge Hall. And I'm going to do them in an optical trap that has a very asymmetric uh, uh, trapping uh, containment. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to hope that even though I have obviously violated rotational invariance by adding those uh, perturbations, it still hopefully is the case that the physics at short range as these particles collide with each other is insensitive to those uh, symmetry breaking effects. So we'll cross our fingers. And that'll mean if, if indeed the interaction between the atoms are rotationally symmetric, it must be that the total angular momentum of the atoms is conserved. So the total angular momentum going in is the same as the value uh, going out. Now that total angular momentum of the atom is the sum of its spin angular momentum and its orbital angular momentum. So again, there's still a lot of possible outcomes to a collision that I have to account for. We'll come up with yet another approximation, which is about uh, dipolar interactions. So these collisions that can end up changing the overall uh, projection of the spin along the field axis. We're going to assume that these collisions are extremely rare. And the effect of that will be that there isn't any way in a collision to mix the spin, or to trade off the spin of the incident particles with the uh, orbital angular momentum of the incident particles and rearrange them at the output. I can't sort of relax some spin angular momentum that an atom might have and have it emerge spinning around with some orbital angular momentum if, if this approximation holds as well. Okay, now things are getting extremely simple because, uh, first of all, S wave interactions, if they occur, um, S-wave interactions occur only when the particles that collide with each other have zero orbital angular momentum relative to one another. And now they must emerge with zero orbital angular momentum as well. That means that all of their angular momentum is in the spin channel, and that's the object that's conserved. So the total spin of the colliding pair is going to be conserved in a collision. I guess I have to make one more approximation as well, which is that atoms are not going to relax out of one hyperfine level down to another. If that occurs, then all bets are off. But anyhow, if I satisfy all of these approximations, then uh, I would conclude the following, that all of the real uh, 
mess of the collision physics has been uh, swept under a rug, and all that we see on the top is this uh, short range, is this, is this pseudo potential, which would be enough to represent all of the effects of the collision. So it's written as follows, that we're going to assume that the short range interactions really just occur when the particles overlap, because we're going to sort of, I guess, coarse grain a little bit. Um, and the strength of the interaction is going to be given by these quantities A, which are lengths, these are the scattering lengths that emerge in the partial wave analysis. And these operators are going to be projections onto the total uh, spin angular momentum of the colliding pair. So all of the interact, all the collisions that can occur, they just boil down to uh, the different uh, scattering events where particles uh, smack into each other with a fixed value of the total angular momentum and then emerge. There's a particular strength to that interaction. Yeah, I guess, why is uh, spin orbit interaction uh, not, not important? It is, uh, it, it turns out not to be important in the gases that are also stable. Um, so, if you wanted to treat the low energy physics of, like the spinner gas physics of chromium, where there are dipolar relaxation collisions, I think you would have to revisit the whole treatment that people have had so far of the spinner gases, which has not been, I don't, I don't think I've seen the theory of it, but I'm certain it's the case. Um, whether the perturbations are large or small, I, you know, I'd, I'd want somebody to, to clarify that for me. But it would strike me that if there is a, a large amount of dipolar relaxation, this can't be the right way to treat the collisions in the end. Uh, but in the cases where we can neglect it, this seems like the right approach. Yeah. This, this one or R2 that you mentioned, is, is it just a magnetic dipole dipole interaction? Or? Yes. Okay, but that, is that any concern or is it extremely weak? So, yeah, that's been an interesting uh, uh, chapter. So, magnetic dipole interactions um, have typically. Okay, so in the beginning, um, people felt that they could they like the magnetic dipole interactions. Basically, you take an atom with, I think it's whatever, half a Bohr magneton, and you consider the typical distance between them and use it with the density, whatever. With that, you quantify the uh, dipolar energy. You find a dipolar energy proportional to density. You also have here um, a collisional interaction energy that's proportional to density. And you think to yourself, uh, if the dipole, so I mean, take, people take the ratio, like a, typical, a dipole energy which is propor proportional to density, and this S wave interaction energy that's proportional to density. And in the alkali atoms that we've been playing with, that ratio is very small, um, part of a thousand or something, really small. So you really have to squint hard to see the effects of dipolar interactions in those systems. Um, then along came chromium. Chromium had a larger dipole moment, so people were able to start seeing effects of dipolar interactions. You know, gases would sort of become deformed because, you know, like ferrofluids, they, uh, they, whatever, they had a, a, a anisotropic spin dependent, or anisotropic interactions now. Um, things got even more extreme when people learned how to have dipolar interactions while at the same time tuning this quantity down to zero, then it's all dipolar physics. Um, in relation to what I'm talking about in this lecture, there's also a comparison of the dipolar energy to the spin-dependent interaction energy, because the dipolar interaction is um, spin-dependent. So you might want to compare it to this other spin-dependent interactions. And there, actually in these spinner gases, you do have to play, pay close attention to the dipolar energy. That they're not, they're not really on totally equal footing, but the dipolar energy is not ridiculously small. Sorry, can someone turn off the light on the screen? There's a one of three chance. <laughs> okay, great. So the uh, molecular potential boils down to this short range interaction. And then an additional simplification is we're working with bosons. And so these identical particles. Uh, can't collide through this channel where the total spin is an odd value. And that's because, uh, so I have, I have uh, bosons and um, the total wave function has to be uh, symmetric. If the total angular momentum of these identical spin bosons uh, is odd, then the spatial wave function also has an odd value of the angular momentum, and therefore there are no S-wave interactions. 
So uh, for bosons, we can moreover neglect all the terms where these things are in a line. So all I have is the even values here. So that's great. So I had this potentially really complicated uh, description of collisions. And we used all of our approximations, including critically this assumption about rotational invariance. And we boiled it down to just a small number of parameters. For two spin one atoms that are colliding, the only numbers I have to know are what's the value of this uh, scattering length and what's the value of this scattering length. And those I just get out of uh, uh, whatever the molecular physics is. Now, this is perhaps not the uh, most convenient form of the uh, of the interactions. We want to turn them into something that looks a little more familiar to, uh, to condensed matter physicists. And I'll just uh, briefly summarize how that occurs. So which was the So for example, for um, let's think about uh, spin one. And I have, uh, I have this operator, which projects the pair of a, the total spin of a pair of atoms to be total spin zero. And I have this other operator as well. And I want to turn these operators into things that I'll recognize. And uh, it's pretty simple. You just use two identities. One is you use the fact that the tensor product of the identity operators is clearly the sum over all these projections. And uh, a second one is I use the fact that uh, the dot product of two spin operators for two atoms <coughs> is um, also a sum of these projection operators. But weighted by the correct value of the dot product in each case. So. Okay, so I have these two identities. And um, moreover, I can restrict the application of these operators just to the states which are spatially symmetric. <coughs> That's what this S will mean. And so clearly then I can just make substitutions. And I can turn uh, an interaction Hamiltonian that looks like this with these projectors um, into something that is uh, simple. So now the short range interaction is uh, some combination of scattering lengths over here. So if I have a, uh, a difference between those two scattering lengths for a particular atom, then uh, this term over here is non-zero. So I have um, uh, sort of a, a Heisenberg-like spin interaction term, where the spin of one atom dotted with the spin of the other atom gives an energy. Yes? Yeah, the F1, F2 are in the same Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a half. And we can work this out for higher values of spin as well. It's not uh, terribly instructive to do so. But basically, okay, so you, you've gone through the argument so far, and then with a little crank turning, we end up with terms that 
we kind of uh, recognize. <coughs> and here it looks like there's an energy that's proportional to the dot product of the spins. And that energy can be positive or negative depending on the difference between the scattered lengths of that atom. One uh, critical thing about the uh, Hamiltonian, that's this short range interaction that's produced, is that it um, is that it, in this piece over here, <coughs> if we uh, if we turn the crank and we think about um, uh, using I don't know Bose uh, creation and annihilation operators to describe the effects of this collision. We're going to find that from this term, we get um, a coefficient, so maybe the product of this times this, I'll just call C1, because it's the thing that occurs first here. And uh, then there'll be terms where, let's say, um, where, let's say, particles collide in the m equals zero state and they emerge in the plus and minus one states. So uh, given that I have this difference, this difference is non-zero, I'll always have these terms. I'll call these the spin mixing terms. These are this, the spin mixing, the reshuffling of the spin values of the atoms inside the trap that is allowed with the total spin still um, conserved along the z-axis. But clearly there's going to be a change in the populations due to these kinds of collisions. And also you know now that the energy of one of these states is going to be dependent not just on uh, the distribution of populations among the Zeeman sublevels, but also the specific coherences between those populations. Right? Because it's those coherences which will determine what the value of this term is. Um, so, for example, I might have a, a, a let's think about a state described in terms of a wave function. So maybe it's condensed, and so it's described by the superfluidity <coughs> parameter. And I'll imagine a situation where, in the different values of uh, m sub f, I have, let's say, a quarter of the population in each of these levels and a half in this level. And then I ask, like, what's the what's the uh, what's the wave function for this uh, superfluid? Well, you know, it could be something like this, or I don't know, maybe it has uh, a complex number in here. Maybe it's complex. And that's sorry, maybe the middle term is imaginary. And even though the the populations of those two states are, are identical the expectation value for a term like that is going to be uh, different, right? Because if I have an i here, then every time I have twice the creation or destruction operator over here, I'll get a minus sign. So the two states that I've indicated, one where there's uh, where the middle uh, element of the wave function is, the probability amplitude is really the one where it's imaginary, they have sort of differing values of this spin-dependent energy. And in fact, uh, with one of the one particular value of this uh, difference, if this difference is negative, then it'll turn out that the ground state for my system is one where this is actually a real quantity, versus if we have the opposite sign of that interactions of that interaction, then uh, then I would take an I there. Those are very different uh, spin one quantum states. So it's these it's the terms like this which give us. Uh, an energy in these systems that depends not just on populations and the distribution of populations, but also on the specific phases. Which is to say there are the terms that give us magnetic order, right? So uh, long range order, let's say, in a superfluid has to do with, uh, you know, the, the phase of the wave function being uniform across space. Um, a magnetic ordering has to do with phases of wave functions at each location, which give us orientation of magnetic moments. And those things being equal in each position. So the relative wave function, not the relative phase, rather the overall phases uh, that give us either kind of long range or 
And given that, it's obvious that mag magnetic ordering and superfluidity have a lot to do with one another in systems where both can occur simultaneously. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Can you change all those A2 and A0? Are they given numbers or we can tune them? Right. So um, I guess in principle they're tunable. I don't know how to tune them. It seems like you would have to come up with a, so as you know, there's ways of tuning these uh, scattering lengths by tuning the molecular potential. And <clears throat> there's a couple of ways to do it. The easier one is this Feshbach resonance approach, where you make use of the fact that you have several molecular uh, potential curves, and they tune differently in, let's say, applied magnetic fields. So you can start bringing, you know, uh, resonant, you can start bringing molecular states of one of these potentials to the zero energy threshold. Um, but when you're doing that, you're certainly breaking rotational symmetry in a pretty obvious way, putting on you know, a thousand gauss field in that direction. Um, and so I don't see that that would be an approach that would conserve all of the pretty physics that we saw from this rotational invariance. Rather, you would get to a situation where all the different types of atoms or all the different spin states have different types of interactions, and it's more complicated. But a way that gives you sort of a resonant tuning of the scattering lengths and also preserves the rotational symmetry has not been worked out yet. Yes, people tried like using an optical flash fog resonance to do that. Yeah, so Mike Chapman at Georgia Tech uh, gave, gave that a try for a while, trying to tune a, a, a photo association transition uh, near resonance and trying to get tuning of scattering lengths that way. Um, first of all, he didn't see much uh, tuning range. It was mostly very lossy. And secondly, I don't believe that there was uh, rotational symmetry left. I don't think I ever thought about that. I think you'd have to think pretty hard about, you know, your, your light's going to come in, and there's going to be polarization of the light field, so that's going to give some uh, preferential direction for the um, for the interactions. Maybe you have to put in something else that'll compensate for it. So I haven't figured that out yet. But it would be certainly nice because then, you know, whatever whatever lump of stuff you have, you can do anything you want with it. You don't have to go buy another. Okay. Um, I want to say a few things about uh, the energy scales in this problem. So uh, the spin dependent, in, oh, here I have a C2, but over there I have a C1. Sorry for the uh, mixed notation. So I have, uh, let's imagine we evaluate the interaction energy in some kind of mean field manner. Um, so in the mean field, I would replace uh, each of these spin operators with the average value of the spin operator. So I'd have the dot, the, the square magnitude of the average value of the spin. Not the spin squared, which is fixed, but the average value of the spin vector, as I've written up there. And that would be multiplied by a density. That's because of uh, this uh, term. And the rest of the stuff just goes into some kind of constant. So. Uh, in, in rubidium, it turns out that uh, the, um, this quantity is, uh, so there's a minus sign in front here, turns out. Okay, so the energy of uh, the system will be minimized if the atoms have the maximum value of the, of the spin. In any case, here's a quantification at the mean field level of how much spin-dependent interaction energy there is. And I can throw in typical values for the scattering length difference, which is small, and for the density, which is small. And the product of those things gives me an energy which corresponds in temperature units to half a nanopel. That's uh, really low. Right. So is anything that I told you relevant at all? Because, for example, um, the thermal energy to which I can bring my gases is typically much higher, maybe 50, maybe 10 nanokelvin. But getting to half a nanokelvin temperature is pretty tough, uh, even for us. Uh, and so why would any of these of this physics be relevant? And secondly, um, what about these external fields? I guess I've already answered that question. So let me mostly focus on the question of why the physics of these spinner gases is interesting even though they are living at these infernally hot temperatures, like 50 nanopolar or something. And the reason is because of those statistics. So, um, what happens, what happens when you cool a gas of spinful bosons? Um, if you just, just neglect the, uh, the interactions between them. Say there's an applied magnetic field of some strength. 
and you just lower the temperature and use just regular ideal gas, um, those statistics, statistical mechanics to figure out what this gas is doing. Okay, so you'll find that you know you have uh, the uh, chemical potential of the uh, of one of the spin projections, of another spin projection, another one as well. And as you uh, raise the density of these gases, these chemical potentials rise. And eventually one of them reaches a chemical potential of zero. And now the Bose condensate forms in this one spin state. Right? Um, now, how close can these uh, energy differences be and still produce a gas which, when it condenses, is completely spin polarized? Well, the answer is actually they can be arbitrarily small. That's one of the sort of the magic of those statistics is that in, in the thermodynamic limit, um, small single particle energy uh, differences all wash out. And so here's just a, a simple result of a calculation for um, what would be the um, magnetization of an ideal gas, ideal Bose gas, as a function of uh, temperature and uh, applied magnetic field in the correct units. And uh, so uh, what do you find? So you find that there's a, there's a place where there's a phase transition from a normal fluid to a superfluid. If you have a really large magnetic field applied, then uh, even, you know, the, the chemical potential differences between these guys are so large that at the Bose condensation uh, transition, the thermal population of these lower energy levels or these more energetic energy levels is really, really small. So you're basically studying BEC of a single component gas. Um, and that occurs at a particular um, critical temperature. At the same density, if you both condense the gas with uh, basically no applied field, then um, you have to get the gas uh, even colder because there's only a third of the atoms in each of the spin levels, and there's going to be a relation between the Bose condensation transition point and the number or the density of the atoms in the gas. So that explains why there's a bit of a curve to this transition line. Okay, so this this here demarcates the superfluid to normal transition of the superfluid. And that um, a given, let's say, particle number, if I have a huge magnetic field, then uh, the phase space density is larger at a given temperature. And then at lower field, uh, where I have all the spin states occupied, the phase space density is reduced because I have fewer atoms in each. Just that, that's as simple as that. But in this, in this uh, graph where you look at the magnetization, you see that, let's say, in this region, let's say at zero magnetic field, uh, as you vary the uh, magnetic field, you go from a gas which is magnetized up to suddenly magnetized down. So that's a ferromagnet. Okay. So both statistics sort of, in the absence of anything else, they give you sort of naturally give you a, a ferromagnetism. Okay. The bosons sort of know how to find the lowest energy state. And uh, they do so extremely precisely once you've uh, put in even just a little bit of offset uh, between the spin up, spin up and the spin down orientations. Or another way of thinking about this is that uh, Bose, that uh, mag magnetic order is like, um, is like a parasitic phenomenon. It takes advantage of something else that has already occurred. So once you have a system where a Bose condensate has formed, you have one portion of your fluid, which is this superfluid, which is you think of as an object that carries no entropy. And then you have the remainder of your fluid, which is the normal fluid, which carries all the entropy. And um, now you, you, want to, you want to see the influence of weak um, magnetic fields on the system. They can obviously influence the zero entropy part, entropy part of the system at any temperature. The entropy, you know, there's not a competition between magnetic order and entropy. So they take advantage of this zero entropy state that's produced by the uh, Bose condensate to be in there. Okay, so this, this then explains why I can expect to see interesting uh, magnetic ordering and spin physics and spin dynamics in a gas where the spin dependent energies are very, very small compared to the temperature. Yes? So uh, is this saying that there is no uh, paramagnetism without a condensate? This is saying that um, the ferromagnetic, uh, the, the temperature which the ferromagnet forms is greatly enhanced due to the condensate. I mean, you can still imagine that a 
a Bose gas with spin dependent interactions at low enough temperatures will maybe look ferromagnetic even without uh, Bose statistics. So, you know, if I could look at a model where I trap a single boson at each site right now, I don't have to think about Bose condensation anymore. And now I ask, how cold does the system in, let's like, say, a mine insulator state have to be to become magnetically ordered? Well, the temperature is going to have to match sort of the single particle exchange energies. Right? It's going to be a really tiny energy level. But here, with Bose statistics giving us this uh, statistical enhancement of the ground state, we can achieve magnetic ordering at much higher temperatures. Another way I often explain this is to think of uh, why, you know, if I have a box and I cool a gas in the box and it becomes a Bose condensate and it forms in the ground state of this box. How does it know what the ground state of the box is? The box is huge. The difference between the first, the ground state, and the first excited state in energy is tiny. How does the system know? Well, the answer is that Bose statistics have already told all the atoms to do the same thing. Like they've given it such statistical weight for that to occur. And given that all the atoms would like to do the same thing, the difference between all the atoms being in the ground state and all the atoms being in the first excited state of a big box is now a pretty large number. So for that same reason, you end up with small um, spin-dependent interactions giving uh, very obvious phenomena even at high temperature. There was a question. Yeah. Yes. So do you actually need spin-dependent interactions at all to get um, magnetic ordering? Because it seems like you know, if, you, if you both condense um, one of, in one of these three component vectors, the, the vector's got to point somewhere, even if your interactions are completely spin-independent. Um, so you will, uh, right, so if the interactions are like fully symmetric, totally spin independent, you would imagine that at exactly at zero magnetic field, you get this thing to both condense. It's just going to condense perhaps into something that just breaks the SU3 symmetry. It's a state, you know, and that would be an interesting uh, scenario. Here we have uh, an interaction energy that has a lower symmetry, so you would think about that, but. In any case. So it's sort so, of like a biasing field, right? So it's, uh, in, 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 in a magnetic model, you're just sort of applying a small biasing field, and when you, get, when you hit the magnetic transition, you get a, a big moment along the... Yes, yes. The, the one subtlety here, I guess, is that uh, the gas that, the gas might... Um, it doesn't have to evolve into a state which is um, magnetically... has a large value of magnetic moment pointing in some direction. There's more options when you're talking about a spin one state rather than spin one. But for this, uh, for this description over here, where we applied a bias field, well, anyhow, theoretically, a bias field which does favor the spin up or the spin down state, then uh, yes, this would be a, a correct description of ferromagnetic. For, for, any, for any type of spin dependent spin independent direction, as complicated as you wish between two bosons, or not even between two bosons, I think, anymore, this will turn out to be the correct baseline. But with, with spin dependent uh, interactions, this is going to be the correct phase diagram, except sort of in a region around here. And in here, we're going to have to figure out what the actual spin dependent interactions tell us to do. Yeah? yeah? I mean, another way to say this, I guess, is you just, that term is multiplied by n. Right? The energy per particle, it gets that spin dependent interaction gets amplified per particle, gets amplified by n. Yeah, that's true also without Bose compensation. It's always multiplied by n. Right? But you're fighting against entropy. So in the non-condensed gas, even having multiplied by n, it's just not strong. So in, in, in your real system, this Fc is all conserved, right, during the time scales of the experiment? Yes. So isn't that an issue somehow to distinguish, like, Real magnetization from, from the fact that you are having just like conservation of the population like to prove that your mind has a stiffness and all that. Yes, right. So very astute. So if you're doing experiments with atoms that do relax in that like chromium, uh, these guys are doing experiments at low magnetic field with these atoms that do undergo dipolar relaxation, and they can test this diagram directly. Because they're they they really do vary the magnetic field. And the magnetization is whatever is produced by emerges from statistical mechanics. In our case, we dial in the magnetization, at least globally, and then we have to work within that space. And we have to think about interpreting our experimental data in terms of, I don't know, ferromagnetism, which is maybe more easily displayed on a plot like this. 
which would you rather have on your axes here? You know, magnetization or magnetic field? So we know how to put magnetization on this axis. And we can think about other, other properties. I'll show you in a sec how it is that we know that the system is truly ferromagnetic. All right, so let me uh, get to that now. We're going to talk about the quadratic statement interaction. And we move on to studying the ground states, which people seem to be asking questions about. OK. So let me, um, let me uh, treat the, the question of what's the ground state of this system in the simplest uh, setting, where I have, um, I'll, I'll just ask, what is the mean field ground state? And leave aside the question of what's the real many body ground state. It's really interesting, but I don't have any experimental data to show you about it, so we'll just skip that piece of it. And um, moreover, I'll assume that, uh, that the atoms are in a single spatial mode. So maybe the atoms are tightly trapped so that the spin, uh, spin degree of freedom is zero dimensional. The gas has to be uniform, has, the spin state of the gas has to be uniform. Or uh, maybe I just want to ask, you know, what is locally the correct magnetic order, which at least will tell me about what should happen in <laughs> extended boxes full of this stuff. Okay. Um, in any case, we're, we're going to assume a, uh, so in a, in a mean field description, right, so we're going to assume that the uh, ground state is just uh, uh, n times the uh, uh, single particle uh, spinner. And um, I'll just evaluate the uh, mean field energy. So let me write it down and then justify what it is that I've written. So this is going to be my mean field energy for my spin one gas. And um, there's going to be this coefficient, which is given according to that difference in scattering lengths over there. There's some density. Maybe that's the mean density in some kind of asymmetric container. Who knows? And then there's the um, mean field value of that f dot f term. And then there's maybe an effect of an applied magnetic field. And then I was pointing out in the earliest slides the uh, presence of an additional term, which is a uh, quadratic Zeeman energy, which would have the following expectation value. <coughs> so again, this energy Q has to do with the fact that, uh, let's say, <coughs> Um, two atoms in the m equals zero state may have uh, either more or less energy than uh, the product of a collision where one of them went down to the m equals minus one state and the other one went down. That's what this quantity Q is quantifying. And if you will, I can describe it by this operator over here. P is, of course, uh, the magnetic field. So I've just been telling you that actually the Magnetic field doesn't matter because this, the atoms don't know how to relax among the Zeeman sublevels and take advantage of the Zeeman energy. But I can use this magnetic field as a Lagrange multiplier, which I can later vary to determine the overall magnetization of the gas. So this, if you will, is either a real field or it's a Lagrange multiplier that tells us the magnetization. Either way. And then here's the spin-dependent interaction. So now I'll just show you what, uh, what phase diagram I get as a function of the parameters of this model, this uh, energy function. Okay, that's what this graph is. So let me go through and explain it. Oh, no. So we can identify two cases, one where this uh, spin-dependent energy has a positive coefficient and one where it has a negative coefficient. This positive coefficient turns out it applies for sodium in its f equals 1 states, happens to be, and this one happens to apply to rubidium. So uh, let's say, let's first look at the uh, sodium case. <coughs> 
So as I increase the, this quadratic Zeeman energy, Q, um, it might not surprise you that the lowest energy state is the one where all the atoms are in the m equals zero state. That's pretty obvious from single particle physics. So that's going to be true in the very large Q limit. And I'm choosing to exhibit that state uh, by a certain geometric representation, something called the Majorana representation down here. And I'm representing the m equals zero state by two points on a sphere, one of which sits on the North Pole and one of which sits on the South Pole. Uh, what are these points? Um, one way to visualize what I'm trying to do here is if I wanted to represent a spin one state as actually the product state of two spin one half objects, where would those two spin one half objects have their spin point? So the m equals zero state is like a, a combination of one, elect one uh, spin one half particle pointing out the other one pointing down. And it's the symmetric combination of those. Okay, so that's, and, and the nice thing about that particular geometric rotation that representation is that it shows you what sort of, um, what sort of remaining symmetries the state has, just by staring at it. So this, uh, this, this state is one that has um, no net spin, the vector spin is zero. So it has no magnetic moment. Uh, but it does have a, a quadruple spin moment. Because after all, it's, it's the m equals zero state along a particular axis, not along a different axis. So you might call this a spin pneumatic state. OK, so the spin pneumatic state is favored in this portion of the phase diagram. If I put on a really large value of this uh, magnetic field, or this Lagrange multiplier turned up to a really high value, then it's obvious that I'll get to a state where, my, uh, where the atoms are pointing in the, where the spin up direction, which I would represent by two spin one half particles pointing up. Okay, so that's uh, this state in this portion of the phase diagram and this state down in the lower portion of the phase diagram. Uh, now other information that there is here, um, you see that this, uh, uh, if, if we didn't have this spin dependent interaction term, the boundaries between these different states would uh, be merge linearly from the origin. So you see that um, this sort of type of interaction that tries to get rid of magnetization uh, energetically favors this state uh, over these states. And that ends up pushing the phase transition lines backwards. Um, and uh, then also there's this region in here which shows you that atoms in the spin up state and the spin down state are able to coexist. So there's admixtures of the two that are allowed. Um, and uh, this, the, F, there are various signatures of this phase diagram that have been seen experimentally. So uh, that was done a long time ago now. Um, one of them was where uh, people took a gas of atoms, a uh, spinner, uh, spinner gas of atoms of sodium, and they trapped them in a long optical trap where there was a magnetic field gradient across the gas. So even accounting for the fact that the total magnetization of the gas is fixed, um, there's still a, a variation in space of, this, uh, of, this, of, the, of the magnetic field. So when you look at the spatial profile of a gas along this long direction, it's like you're probing a line through this phase diagram somewhere. And so by looking at the uh, spatial distribution of atoms along the extent of the gas, they're basically able to characterize the, the phase diagram. For example, they could tell that um, the amount of the gas which was in the m equals zero state was a little bigger than it was, than it would have been without the spin dependent interactions. So indeed, they can see that the m equals zero population seems to be sort of stabilized energetically due to the interactions in sodium. That's, I guess, shown by these experimental data. And that gave evidence for the correct uh, type of this antiferromagnetic or pneumatic type of interaction in sodium. Uh, people also did other experiments that demonstrate that that is indeed the ground state uh, phase diagram. Because this, this transition here between these two uh, ground states turns out to be uh, first order. And uh, therefore, if you try to make a mixture of atoms in the m equals zero state and the m equals one state, they should phase separate, uh, like you typically get first order transitions. So there's evidence of phase separation that people saw experimentally. Yes. So if you, but if your Fz is conserved, then you may have trouble actually going to that ground state. Like if you tell some, you know, if your collision don't change Fz. And you might not be able to kinetically, not be able to go to some parts of the base diagram. 
Um, Would you, like, if you, I mean, if you have, if you have a, if you had a, a in, in this case, over here, if you had a field gradient across your gaps, then whatever is the value of the magnetization, there's always a way to accommodate it by drawing uh, a, a vertical line somewhere, uh, uh, somewhere through this phase diagram, so that I mean, the value of Q is determined by the experimentalist who dials in the quadratic zeta, and this value of you know. The mean value of this parameter p in your gas that has to do with what magnetization you wrote into the gas, but the spatial variation across the gas that's something that uh, is given exter externally. So there's always going to be a way to sort of straddle a line through this phase diagram wherever it is, and at least in a local density sense, always uh, be in the ground state. Mm -hmm. The question is, well, now if I don't have that kind of um, uh, bias to the system. And I just start the system, and it, it, it's you know it's a typical thing with a uh, yes. There can be situations where you're prevented from reaching the ground state. Yes. Um, if you wish to measure the critical properties of the device, you see ones that are exhibited by the superfluid transition, or also like in the magnetic field of That's a great question. In, in three dimensions, I think we believe that you will basically just see um, I don't know how to answer that question. I, I, I guess I'm wondering which, which phase transition lines we're crossing where. So if, if we're coming in from high temperature and going into an ordered state, will we simply see you know, regular BEC transition in a three-dimensional system, I would assume this, just from the lesson that mean field should be good there. But in in two-dimensional systems, you know, maybe you know some of the work that Joel Moore was working on, um, you expect you know different states within the superfluid, some which are magnetically ordered, some which aren't, and there I think the situation would look more complicated. If you're already in the superfluid regime and you're crossing sort of sideways through this phase diagram, I, I don't know. Um, okay, now for uh, um, rubidium, what do people know about uh, um, the phase diagram? So to explain that, let me let me focus instead on, on this lower panel of uh, graphics. And there, what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out the energy of different candidate ground states. <coughs> at a setting where p is 0, just to make things symmetric and simple. Okay, so I'm, I'm drawing, for example, uh, the state which is the mz equals 0 state. Uh, you know, so p is 0. There's no quadratic Zeeman shift on that state. There's no mean field energy to that state. So that state just has a mean energy of 0. Um, I'm drawing, uh, here are the energies of uh, states in the green line and the red line that are uh, ferromagnetic um, or are pneumatic pointing sideways, as I've shown over here. Okay, so this is like either, um, I guess the red line is states that are pointing up versus pointing down. And um, there I have a large quadratic, I have a quadratic Zeeman energy because this thing is one. And I do have a spin dependent energy. If I look at the transverse pneumatic state, that's an equal superposition of atoms being in the plus one and the minus one state. So it has the same value in the quadratic examine energy, but it has no spin-dependent energy. Okay, so that gives me the energies of these red lines and green lines. And then the last line is this black thing, which turns out, and we'll talk about it later, turns to be sort of a, a certain sort of non-obvious extremum of this mean field energy functional that exists in a particular range of the quadratic Zeeman energy. So it's given by this uh, black line. So we just ask, you know, what's the lowest energy state uh, at p equals zero? So in the case of sodium, um, what you expect is that at a positive value of a quadratic shift, the lowest energy state is the pneumatic state with the pneumatic director pointing along z. And at negative values of q, the lowest energy state is the pneumatic state pointing sideways. 
and, um, and that's been experimentally observed by a group at uh, Georgia Tech who took a gas that was equilibrated with a region of, in a region of, uh, or in under conditions where Q was positive, and then they transitioned, they flipped the sign of Q using microwaves, and they found that the uh, atoms uh, redistributed, and uh, redistributed in a way that uh, there were regions where uh, atoms had gone out of the m equals zero state into the minus one and plus one states, but these minus one and plus one states had the same spatial distributions. So that was clearish evidence that they, that uh, on, for sodium, uh, the ground state is indeed described by these, by the combination of these two lines. Okay, in rubidium, what do we expect? We expect that at very high quadratic Zeeman shift, the lowest energy state should be the m equals zero state. As the quadratic Zeeman shift drop, drops below a particular value, the lowest energy state should be a state that has uh, some amount of transverse magnetization. And then uh, finally, when the quadratic Zeeman shift is zero, it should be a state that's either longitudinally or, that is, sorry, longitudinally uh, magnetized. So here at P equals zero, you expect the system to show three phases, um, a pneumatic phase, an easy plane ferromagnetic phase, and an easy axis ferromagnetic phase. So those predictions have also been seen experimentally. Um, so um, I think Mike Chapman's group at, at Georgia Tech was the first uh, to observe this. Their experiment was uh, sort of described by the following. They start with the atoms in the n equals zero state. They change the quadratic Zeeman shift from having a large value to a small value. They wait. And then finally, they see how many atoms emerge in the different spin states when they analyze the populations in the gas. And they find that it took a while for the system to equilibrate. That's obviously the dynamics portion of that lecture, which I guess will come on Monday. Um, but uh, at, at equilibrium, they found that uh, below a particular value, the quadratic Zeeman energy, which is dialed around using the magnetic field as a parameter, uh, they found less, less atoms in the m equals zero population, in the m equals zero state and finally tending toward maybe half the atoms being n equals zero, which is what you expect for the transverse magnetized state. This spin. So that was some evidence of the correct uh, um, phase diagram. And then my group uh, had something to say about it. And we were able to not just study um, the populations in the spin states, but also the coherences among the populations in the different spin states. Uh, how do we do that? So now I'll just explain a little bit of the experimental technique. Um, we use the magnetization sensitive imaging method. And it uses the fact that if you have a spin polarized gas, it is optically birefringent. So for example, if I'm driving atoms on a transition, such as shown here between the F equals one and F equals two levels, that the upper one is the, one of the electronic excited states. <clears throat> then if my atoms are, let's say, spin up, they will have a stronger interaction with spin polarized light than if they're spin down. So for example, if I take imaging light near this transition and I send it through a gas of atoms, the light will acquire a, uh, a phase shift and maybe a polarization rotation, which is dependent <coughs> on the spin distribution inside of the gas of atoms. And then I can use standard imaging techniques, like I'll find in an optics textbook, to turn that sort of dispersive signal into an intensity signal on my camera. Um, so for example, if I do an experiment uh, shown here, where I look at the rotation of a linear polarized uh, light